me reading a lot of the comments on your videos, Liza, and a lot of them talk Where about- Where you at? <laughs> Upload, hello? <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> Liza Koshi quit YouTube? One of the biggest creators on the platform disappears. Although I was at like my peak in terms of numbers, in terms of eyes and partnerships. Liza Koshi, everybody. Liza Koshi, The everybody. fastest growing YouTuber ever. I just, I needed me, I missed me, and I refused to be ignored. Who is ignoring you? Who is ignoring Liza Koshi? You know, you're very good at what you do. <laughs> Liza, it's so exciting to be here with you in New York. I know you're on late night shows, you're doing interviews, so to take the time out just means the world. Thank you. Made you made me sound way busier, like I fit this <laughs> in. I was happy to do it and happy to sit with your brilliant brain. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Liza. I know that for two and a half years, yeah. you uploaded every single week. Mm -hmm. And I was rereading a lot of the comments on your videos, Liza, and a lot of them talk about- oh, Upload, hello? <laughs> we'll talk about that. Uh, don't worry, we'll talk about that. But a lot of them, just even the ones that were dated back to when you uploaded, just talk about how effortless a lot of your comedy is. Ah. And I know that so much effort goes in behind the scenes. Can you talk a little bit about a video that yeah. you put out? What is the timeline? Like, are you scripting? Are these yeah. off the cuff jokes? Absolutely. So I had two different channels going at one time. I had Liza Koshi and Liza Koshi too. And at the time I really just wanted to have premium content on Liza Koshi. And on the second channel it was kind of more free, you know, kind of host like. I didn't realize that I really was uploading my hosting reel and my acting reel. So you could go to each separate channels to see different facets of my perspective on the world, my lens. So on Liza Koshi, I had a lot of sketches, a lot of, you know, really thought out ideas that look effortless, but really what's happening is weeks before I'm going to the dollar store and looking at each product, understanding what I could do and how I can, you know, write a joke around a specific word on that product and raise it up to camera uh, and then hopefully give a natural, effortless um, delivery when it comes to day of shooting. So huh. it takes some pre-production that I never really talked about. So I never really gave people an inside look of what it took to create those videos because I said, okay, no, you'll see it when it's posted. Like that'll be it. That's the the proof. Wow. Yeah. Wait, so you're going to the dollar store. You're picking up yeah. like a, like a, like a basketball. What? This is only 79 cents. Come on, man. It's a dollar store. Get this cheap stuff out of here. Oh my God. This is a dollar. A dollar. A dollar. A dollar. Dang. That's so cheap. I can go balls to the wall in this place. Oh, sorry. That joke was scripted. Like, Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's some moments that are just like free in the moment. I see something I didn't see the day before and I'll go pick it up and have fun with it. But it kind of showcases my, I didn't realize at the time now that I've been in the industry yeah. and have had experience and have, you know, been so fortunate to direct actors and to be one myself on a set. Now do I realize that, oh, I'm giving a natural delivery to something that was pre-scripted the day before. Like this huh. is also showcasing that I'm able to take something and make it new again or, you know, give it a new fresh version of it. So that's that's what, you know, now that I've been on set and in that frame of mind and wearing that hat, I understand, oh, this is just acting in a different yeah. form and it's my, in, in my own version of it, yeah. How, how do you do that, by the way? We just did a speaking event together for YouTube yeah. and I feel like so much of you that is like, <laughs> thank you, amazing. Liza. How <laughs> do you, you do it? How did you keep it fresh? No, 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 this is about you. What amazed me about you is like, I'm watching you during rehearsals, I'm mm -hmm. hearing it for the first time, natural delivery, everyone's in stitches laughing. Then you get on stage today and you give it for the third or fourth time yeah. and it sounds just as natural, maybe <laughs> even more spontaneous. But to me, it's mind blowing to hear that that is something you've done in your videos. You walk into these yeah. places and it sounds uh, just as natural. How do you do that for all the people that's like, you know, I don't want a script. Mm. I want to turn on the camera mm. and just do it off the cuff because that's my authentic self. Mm. Like, how do you script but then make it natural once the cameras turn on? Ooh, thank you for asking that. I feel like it's so nice to have the bones. Mm. So let me tell you my signs because yeah. I've lived in LA too long. I'm Aries, Virgo, Virgo. <laughs> so that means the Virgo plans the script and is mm. very particular, very specific, wants things her way. And the Aries is impulsive. <laughs> Huh. So this is my diagnosis, okay? <laughs> I went to a psychologist. Um, he, basically, the Aries <laughs> allows me to just be super impulsive and spontaneous and allows me to, you know, be observational and catch things in the moment and play off of that, which is what I did today. Yeah. Jumping onto that stage, you know, realizing the CEO that spoke before me yeah. could be my Lauren Michaels yeah, in my yeah, SNL yeah. skit yeah. Um, and then applying that in the moment. And yes, I'm 100% pretending like this is my SNL monologue. <laughs> now, let me tell you how these dreams became my reality. Now, remember how I'm pretending to host SNL right now? David Cohen is Lauren Michaels in my brain. 
Whereas that wasn't a thought that I had the day before, mm. but allowing that to be free. So yeah. have the bones and then you build the meat around it too. And just allowing yourself to have fun with it and find the joy in it again, instead of thinking I, I delivered that perfectly yesterday. It was in this tone, this inflection, you get kind of technical about it. Your left brain really wants to marry the success that you had with that delivery yesterday. But the right brain is where it's yummy and you can find the creativity in it again and find the flow in it again. So I try to make sure I stay more right brain and stay more present in it. Yeah. A lot of meditation happens too. It's very clear that I need it, but uh, staying present is the ultimate key to a fresh delivery every single time. Yeah. And the key for acting specifically is like listening and it, they say acting is reacting, but really it's just listening and mm. being so present, which you so brilliantly are. Thank you, Liza. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I want to ask about another video where it seemed like you're so present and honestly, I would say if YouTube had a Hall of Fame of videos, this would belong in it. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Do you Thank know what I'm you. About? 73 questions. You're going to say which parody. one? <laughs> Just kidding. Humility. <laughs> the 73 that, questions. That yeah. one where you took on your alter ego of Jet. Yes. They probably just got here. Oh, Jet? Hello. Hey, Jet, we're Vogue. Oh, hello, Vogue. Hi. We're, uh -huh. we're here to be. Yeah, well, we're here to do the 73 question interview. I heard you call him your sausage fierce. Is that He's right? He's my sausage fierce. Yeah, my yeah. Sasha fierce, but you know, the off brand version. <laughs> How did you plan that video? Because yeah. that to me was such a catapult in your career. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about all the things that happen afterwards. For the two people that didn't watch that video, um, <laughs> what was that video about? Take us through. How are you thinking about was it as deliberate as that Vogue is doing the 73 questions yeah. format? Yep. I want to replicate it. Like, Take me behind the scenes of the few days before as you prep for that. Absolutely. So Jet Pakskinski <laughs> uh, was a character... I said that like he died. He still lives within me, okay? <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, Jet was a character that is kind of based off of loosely, super loosely, my dad. Mm. So he kind of <laughs> looks like my dad a little bit. If you're wondering what my father looks like, I take after him, his only son. Mm. Uh, but he has a little like bull cut and a little mustache for those who haven't seen him. And he's just overly confident. He's delusionally confident, which is what I've banked off of for my career too. Mm. So of course, a part of him lives within me. Uh, but he is just, he can't do a damn thing, but he thinks he can do anything. And... Throughout the course of this like interview, I'm trying to figure out what is the most confident answers? What does it look like to be a man in this world mm -hmm. <laughs> who's, who's like never been told no? And if he ever heard no, he heard what was that? Go. OK, keep going. Awesome. <laughs> so that's Jet. And I love tapping into him because he just he has he's monotone. He has no expression whatsoever. And it just feels like a fun sausage fierce to step into <laughs> before going into a room and taking up space. And Jet always takes up space. So that's what I think Sasha Fierce does for Beyonce. Yeah. Beyonce. I think I think all, a lot of performers have that alter ego of sorts that helps them feel like they're a superhero putting their cape on. And now those are my characters. Yeah. Uh, I had Helga, who was like a more of a maternal character. You know, being 19 in L.A., I was looking for that maternal you know figure from my mother mother mm -hmm. being a kid still raising herself alone in LA and always had the support and you know communication with my mother but you know wanted to create a character out of that too and what did that look like so these different facets of my personality or the voices in my head took on these you know physical forms and Jet for that video specifically I just wanted to answer 73 questions in the most confident way possible in the most absurd way possible we're watching these Vogue interviews of these incredible celebrities and <laughs> actors everyone and they're answering these questions while doing the most mundane things in their home like just I don't even know what it is it's like lint rolling like yeah. maybe not even that far but you know they're just kind of like a, you know pouring themselves a glass of water and then drinking it or whatever it is and I wanted to see how absurd I could make this specific interview it's like mm. him slamming the microwave <laughs> and putting like a pineapple in it or him spilling milk all over himself and it was just a lot you know, to, to keep the audience, audience's short attention span, uh, involved in the video too. So it was just how much absurdity can we add? How many layers can we add to this video? Liza, I have stats here that I pulled that parody that you put out of the Vogue 73 questions format has 32 million views to date. That beats out the actual Vogue videos that they did with Nicole Kidman that has 9.3 million views, Reese Witherspoon, 9.1 million views, other folks like Roger Federer, 6.6 .6 million views. What happened in the days after you uploaded that video? Because that started trending really quickly. Did Vogue reach out? Did other folks reach out? Did you feel your life changing? Like, take me through. It's trending. What's going on in your life and in your inbox yeah. right afterwards? Life 
changed, but like in a vacuum for me. <laughs> so I'm watching all of this unfold online. I'm watching the views come in. Um, and then I just stopped watching because I was in disbelief that it was really happening. And so a week later, I want to say, or maybe a couple weeks later after that, that um, the viewership had gone had surpassed somehow their videos with that concept, 73 questions, that they reached out and said, hey, you want to do the real one? Like as as real you, unless that is you. Is that you? That's disturbing. Um, <laughs> so then we did the actual 73 questions hit with Vogue. Liza, it's Vogue. Oh my God, I'm the real Liza. one? Liza Koshy. It is the real one. <laughs> Here we are in person where you've oh. done your massively successful parodies of this format. Stop flirting, please. And in that video specifically, it's so nuts. That feels like such a turning point, as you say, because in that video, I had, I raised some cookies up from my oven with no oven mitt, of course, because they were store-bought cookies. And I wrote, Met Gala, question mark? And I rose that, I love you saying, you know this story, don't you? You did the research. I've studied it. I, I got know, questions. I know, yeah. I see the notes. But I uh, raised those cookies up out of the oven. It said Met Gala question mark. And that year I was invited to do the interviews at the Met Gala at the very top of the carpet as a Vogue red carpet correspondent. A lot of questions about that. Before we get there, how many people showed up to your house from the Vogue team? Oh my gosh, so many people are behind the camera. Yeah. It is, um, and that was pre-pandemic, so they weren't condensing right, right. teams up in your home. <laughs> Nobody took their shoes off. Do you know how crazy that is for a little child of an immigrant? Ooh, take <laughs> I'm not a mother yet, but I would smack you. Um, <laughs> I think it was like 20. No, no, more than that. It had to at least been like a total of 45 in and out, but also like gaffers. People were setting up lighting. Wow. I just moved into that home too. So I still have to invoice Vogue for a lot of the marks <laughs> they left on my walls. But uh, <laughs> Whoa. over 40 people to put together yeah. a video that looks like such a mm -hmm. seamless walkthrough of yeah. somebody's house and life. I know. And Joe is amazing. Joe conducts all the 73 questions interviews. Yeah. He's so brilliant. He's so like connected. And you're looking at the camera. You're looking down the barrel the entire time. So it's mm. very hard. You're here, mm. but I can't look at you. It's like me answering and talking to you but looking at the camera the whole time and being oh, like yeah wow. yeah yeah because the camera is like the person coming into the exactly. home exactly but he's off camera right so. it's like his pov like mm. i'm looking at him yeah. and i'm looking at you yeah but he's brilliant he came up i think he conceptualized 73 questions and so i became a real big fan of him and yeah. so i did i think a couple other 73 questions videos after that too yeah, yeah. I, I mean i talk about it all the time finding that format and it's repeatable especially as a media company is huge right and so I think they did a great job of that. What was going through your head as you saw, hey, I did a video with just me and I believe David was recording right behind. Yes, exactly. 73 yeah. questions. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, this was a production team of two that got yeah. over 30 million views. And now here a few weeks later, yeah. you're a production team of 40. Yeah, absolutely. Walking Let me like, give credit to him where credit is due yeah. because he helped me record that video, I think seven times. Really? And I'm going to blame it on him because he kept messing up the questions. And I was like, that's not the <laughs> but I 100% messed up so many times too. I almost chopped off a finger whenever I was chopping something on the counter. Um, but seven times is the amount of times it took to execute that 73 questions video with Jet. It was wow. a full, there was no cut in between. It was a full one single take and we kept up the pace as well as we could. But that 73 questions with Vogue, mm. that took, I believe, three times. So the third time is what you saw. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, they do it in one take. They don't hide it in any way. Yeah. Like, and that yeah. took a full day versus, yeah. um, I think we made that in like three hours. Wow. Scripting <laughs> to hours? filming. Oh, that scripting is like me in bed the night before just trying to figure out, like <laughs> tapping into the character and writing down and all my scripts on my notes. That's my, my notes app is where all my scripts live. Really? I have about 20,000 plus notes. Wow. Yeah. It's so cool Don't to hack. hear about how much process goes into comedy yeah. and natural delivery. Cause yeah. I watched that video. I'm like, she did that on the first take. Oh man. At, at that point, it's just, you're mad and you want to get through it. <laughs> like you've had some fights start because of it. And you're just trying to get it over with. Yeah. But it was fun. It was very fun. So yeah. you hit upload on that video. Vogue did the 73 questions. Yeah. Uh, what happened after that? Because to be invited to the Met Gala yeah. is a big deal, but to host and do red carpet interviews is yeah. next level. Nice. What's going on in your life after you do those 73 questions on Vogue's yeah. actual channel? Like, how are you thinking about your career, YouTube? Like what, what's going on that led to the Met Gala as the next inflection point? So I had big shoes to fill, mm. uh, very fashionable shoes to fill, mm. might I add. <laughs> Andre Leon Talley was the original red carpet correspondent for Vogue. Mm. Um, I believe also a friend of Anna Wintour's, like is a massive big wig in the fashion community and God rest his soul. I think we lost him this past year and uh, he was amazing. I watched all of those interviews in preparation for it. Um, and I just took note from that. I was also given a thick binder mm. from Vogue. Uh, they really prepped me. They're one of the 
breeziest, most well-planned productions, mm. but they gave me the biggest of notebooks. And I just, I put that to the side and I just went on Instagram for each person. <laughs> Gen Z and me really yeah. screamed. And I, you know, I went and looked at the most recent happenings in each person's life. Um, there's, you know, 200 plus attendees, maybe more, maybe less, I forget, it's a blur. Mm. So I'm, I'm, you know, I go to the, I reference the book, the Bible. I um, play the role of Anne Hathaway in Devil Wears Prada. Mm. And actually somebody, somebody off camera is really being my eyes and ears. They're mm. telling me, Lady Gaga's at the end of the carpet. Like she's on her way up. Oh, Harry Styles is here, Harry Styles. I'm like, y'all don't have to tell me them. I know them, <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, I was newer into the fashion world at that time. Now I've done the research and I've had the experience. Now I'm at the faces and put the mm. names to the faces and so they know mine too but at the time it was brand new for me so I just was studying 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 and prepping 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 praying 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 mm. and it's it's a whirlwind but to be the first creator to uh host the top of the red carpet is such an honor such an honor and then I came back for 2018 2018 2019 and then 2020 of course a little pandemic hit and uh Coco set us back. <laughs> we were going to do a third year, I believe, oh, but wow. instead we did like a video just yeah, giving like a, a full rundown of all my reactions from years prior. And I still can't believe that was one of the most fun, most terrifying jobs I've ever had the honor to do. It is terrifying. I've done one red carpet interviews like yeah. at the streamies and you're like, people are coming at you. It's so much chaos. Yeah. But you not only handle it with so much great, like it, you're, you're like a, in, in the most complimentary way possible, you're a shapeshifter in the way that huh. you see somebody coming. Thank you. And I feel like you change your personality to match their energy. <laughs> yeah. Like what, what's going through your head as you see like Kanye and Kim Kardashian, oh my like walking gosh. up. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm, it's nuts. I'm also, that's a moment to acknowledge the, the recovering people pleaser that I ever am and the relapsing people pleaser that I am. As soon as someone comes up, I match their energies. I'm like, hey, how you doing? You nervous? <laughs> Me too. Oh my God. Like it's, it's fun. It's such a challenge, but it's also, I'm, I'm, I'm a genuinely curious person. So to be able to be in the position to ask the questions is something that I naturally take on in life anyways, as do you. Mm. Um, so I, I, to prep, I mean, Kanye and, and Kim specifically, like Kanye said, tonight's about her. She looks amazing. Ask all the questions to her. And then Kanye just stood in the background with sunglasses on and <laughs> didn't speak in the interview. And, and at the very end, I just threw in a compliment towards him and made him smile. And yeah. that was... That was cool. <laughs> yeah. Any other off camera moments yeah. or things that uh, stake out? I just remember feeling so much more in my power and in my voice the mm. second year around. Mm. I understood what was to come. I understood, you know, the tone. I understood, you know, slowing my pace and being all the more present. The first year was such a whirlwind. It felt yeah. like, you know, the little kid in the cafeteria. Where do I sit? Where do I go? And mm. I'm also the first, you know, creator to to do this yeah. job and I want to, you know, set the precedent right and do it well. And it's pressure to be the first sometimes, but I know how much of a path it's going to blaze for now. Emma Chamberlain, who is crushing it. And th th we all do that for each other, right? Like to acknowledge all creators paving the path for e path for each other. Lily Singh broke down doors for me and I got to waltz through those. And I did the same for her in some ways. And Emma's done the same for me in some ways. And I'm mentioning, mentioning female creators because there's, not as many as I want there to be. There's a lot, but there's more on the rise that like I can't wait to see wear so many different hats and crowns that they deserve to wear. You know, that outfit that you wore at the Met Gala, Liza, I felt like you took up so much space in a good way. Thank you, I did. It was two of me. Yeah, yeah. It's it was like, like, a, a, like a Chinese finger, like, <laughs> trap. <laughs> yeah, was, I was stuck in that. It was amazing. <laughs> and I feel like that's like a metaphor for what you're doing in your career right now. What statements are you trying to make? How are you trying to be heard in ways that you weren't heard before? Yeah. I mean, thank you for noticing that because it is super intentional. Um, I feel like back to a child of an immigrant mentality of nose to the pavement, keep working, you're silent. There's also the whole idea of, you know, 10 years of silence pouring in the 10,000 hours. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll lift my head after the 10,000 hours. And then I, I've, I've fully developed my wheelhouse. That's when I'll speak up. No, talk about the process. Talk about where you're at right now. It's all so valuable. And especially as creators creating, I want to let you in. And this is, I think, a new chapter in my career where I'm being all the more vulnerable and more open about my process and what it took to take and what it took for me to be here. And I am going to steal a quote from Zendaya because she's Zendaya. <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of carpets, in terms of me taking up space, in terms of making a statement and having a bold moment, I live for the moment and so does she. She said, I refuse to be ignored. 
I too refuse to be ignored. I will be heard. And if it takes that moment on a carpet to, you know, have the representation of an Indian designer and represent Mm -hmm. my people and my background to bring, you know, a spotlight on different artists, but also on my own voice of stepping into this new chapter in my career and into womanhood. People saw me grow up online. Mm -hmm. I, I started Vine when I was a junior in high school and was bored and got into YouTube and dropped out of college. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And fortunately it worked in my favor, but I, you know, I want to let other creators who are pursuing this path, you know, it's, it's so valuable to, to hand down what I've taught or what I've learned and what I've been taught. And there's so many nuggets now that I have in my back pocket that I can give to these other creators. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, stretch, show them your wingspan, like live in this moment and, and, and allow yourself to really absorb and be present in it because, you're going to hand it back down one day too. And it's this circle of life that just keeps going. We're just a newer industry mm-hmm. and, um, you know, a new form of artists that are, are coming to be. So, you know, hand the nuggets down as you can. I, I want to ask you about that nuggets, but I'm also thinking about people who are listening to this and wondering who is ignoring Liza Koshy. <laughs> she is getting millions of views. Yeah. Like for younger generations, like you are a role model, like people are watching your videos. Yeah. At that time, it's just so interesting to hear you say, who is ignoring you at that time? You know? We'll get right back to the video, but first I want to thank our sponsor, Flavors, which is a shoppable video platform started actually by my former colleague from YouTube, Alejandro, and it's built around one of my favorite topics in the world food. Whether you're a food creator or just a foodie, Flavors is where you can watch your favorite chefs and creators and with just a few taps, buy the groceries and utensils that they're using on screen. But what I think Flavors is doing differently than most platforms aren't is that they're giving creators a piece of the pie. They're giving them equity. A lot of platforms say that they're creator first, but Flavors is putting their money where their mouth is so you grow as they grow. In other words, they're issuing shares of their company to creators to reward them for their creativity and being there early because ultimately it's the creators that make a platform what it is. I mean, just imagine if the early creators of other platforms like YouTube and Instagram were rewarded like this. And I'm excited for the ripple effect that this may have on the entire industry. So check out the link below to see if you're eligible for their fund and the additional incentives that Flavors is offering in the next 60 days. All right. Now back to the video. I don't know if it's ignoring me so much as trying to define me. Mm. And I blame that on the definition that I wrote for myself at one time. Mm. And I blame with no shame whatsoever. At one point I was, you know, just creating a certain form of content. I created the idea of what you were going to see from me, the expectation, I set it. Yeah. And I delivered. And I, I, I want to say I conquered. I mm. did well in that. But I've evolved as humans do, as creators do, and I have a different story to tell. I have a more embellished, lived story to tell from 10 years ago. And what people don't realize, I think, is is the box that I, you know, I built for myself. I compare it kind of to, um, what is it, like the Disney kid breaking out of that box that they were hired to be into. And I kind of created my own box, as creators do for themselves and what you can uh, expect from them. And I broke out of that and it was uncomfortable for some people and it was mm. disappointing for some people. And as the recovering people pleaser that I am, uh, that was hard for me to, you know, disappoint, but it was the two and a half years that I was consistently uploading on my main channel and also my second channel. I uploaded for every single, uploaded for every single week and I didn't miss any weeks. And finally I took a second to realize that I was, I was pressuring myself into performing in a certain way that people expected of me. Mm. And I didn't see the glimmer behind my eye when, you know, editing, spending the hours editing more than you are performing. Um, I didn't see that glimmer in my eye anymore. And I realized I was forcing myself back into a box that I was growing out of and rightfully so. Mm. And I took that step back and that was for my mental health. And later on we saw, you know, our, our world top world-class gymnasts taking a step back for their mental health, watching Trevor Noah take a step back for his own, like his own lifestyle. He wants to, you know, pursue other endeavors of his as he should. Um, we've always given the coupon to Rihanna who's done it all. (laughs) Like like she, you know, is going off and, and, and being a business entrepreneur and the brilliant CEO she is. So we're allowing people to evolve. And sometimes you get caught up in your own, um, internal dialogue that sometimes is the external dialogue in the comments. But a lot of people don't realize that I, my, uh, acting and hosting and creating ran parallel at the same time. I've been acting just as long as I've been creating, but 
what I created online, my digital content had more of a magnifying glass on it. Mm. And I was also acting at the same time, series on Hulu or series uh, that I created on YouTube yeah. or series that I was so lucky to be a part of on Netflix. And they grew together. It just so happened that YouTube had the most eyes on it. So then the title of influencer and creator and that came to be. And mm. I, I honor those. Those are my roots. I love those. I water those. I will forever pour one out for those for Vine every time. <laughs> but also actor and producer is what I've been and host at the same time too. And it just didn't have as much, uh, a lot of people weren't hearing that yeah. at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I looked up your IMDB. You have eight hosting credits, like Dancing With Myself with Shakira and Nick Jonas, like New yeah. Year's Rock and Eve. 33 acting credits. Yeah. Uh, I believe you're in the Directors Guild. I am in the DGA. We need more female directors. Right. You, Shonda Rhimes, 33 <laughs> acting credits, late night appearances. Yeah. When you took that break on YouTube, mm -hmm. there was something really interesting in the video that you uploaded right after you came back. You said two things that just struck me. Uh, one, you said this is the first time in your life that you felt like a success. And I'm so proud of the progress that I've made because now I consider myself to be successful. Yeah, it's the first time I've said that. Woo! Which I'm yeah. like, what? Like yeah, after you, all those numbers? <laughs> yeah, after all of that. Um, and you said you have a renewed focus. Like, what, what were you thinking yeah. about during that time off? Um, I also heard you uploaded a lot of videos that only were for you, video diaries. What were the themes of those videos like that you're telling yourself as you took time off to kind of have this renewed focus for your next chapter? Yeah, I mean, I think there was such a weight and worth placed on those quantities, the number. That felt so much like my sense of self and my my worth and what I was able to bring or achieve was so tied to my value, was mm. so tied to societal success was the numbers versus individual success was my mental health and mm. my place of peace and, and discovering myself in my early 20s. So I mean, creating from the age of 19 to 22 is already such that get those years are such transitional moments in your own evolution too. Yeah. So you're stepping into your own, you're, you know, you're unlearning what was taught in your childhood because that might not have necessarily been your your soul's terms and conditions that you needed to abide by the way your parents taught you so you're teaching yourself all over again as a young adult but I'm also doing all of that on camera too and then expected to be a role model of sorts and be setting the pace for you know younger kids watching me so it felt like a lot of pressures all at once yeah and although I was at like my peak in terms of numbers in terms of eyes in terms of uh you know partnerships I just I needed me, I missed me mm. and I lost that version of me and I missed her. So I decided to take that step back and take that step away. And I think it really, part of the work is the rest mm. and I needed that rest. And it, I, I did it at first with the mentality of, oh, I'm gonna rest so I can get back to work. Mm. And that is, yeah, that is the uh, brown kid for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna rest so I can get back at it. And I, you know, I, I changed that mentality to more of a meditative one, to one that I took a seat back and I acknowledged my accomplishments and I wasn't doing that. I was moving at a thousand miles per minute where I wasn't acknowledging, you know, how much, how many dreams had come true that I yeah. realized or that I didn't realize would ever come true at all. Mm. And I wasn't celebrating myself. I was just being so hard on myself. I had a, a really tough inner dialogue for a while and yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, put on a face anymore and, and be that for other people if I couldn't even be that for myself and how hypocritical would that be? Mm. So it would be doing myself a disservice to continue being what I was and not creating the quality of content that I wanted to create. Mm. So yeah, I, I lost that spark and I wanted to regain it again. And I feel like I have in a totally different way. And I'm so lucky to have the clarity and to have the peace of mind and to have you know, deeper connections with my friends and family and faith that I watered during that time mm. and are still consistently watering. And it's your constant work in progress and masterpiece at the same mm. time. One of the other things that a lot of people don't know about that you did during this break is you started production on your own show, Lies on Demand. It's actually a really big reason for the break because there was so much going on with Lies on Demand that uh, I was like, I, I'm being demanded everywhere. I can't. <laughs> and I want to ask about the writer's room specifically. Yeah. Can you take me on the inside of the writer's room? Like what was going on and, and, and what were you thinking after being a solo writer for your videos yeah. for so many years? 
years. Now having a team, like how many people are in the room? Yeah. How did you think about ideas? And that changed your perspective. Like, you know what? Mm-hmm. Doing it solo, I don't know if I'm going to go back to that. Mm-hmm. This is what I see as the future of how to extend my creativity. Yeah. Uh, writer's room consists of a wall and spaghetti. <laughs> and it's everybody throwing everything everywhere all at once. Mm. Um, trying to create and conceptualize episodes for a show. And then from there, the writers take that and run home and, uh, you know, whip up a script and then bring it back, get the notes. Like it is such a process that is far different than me and my thumbs in my bed with you know, on the notes app. <laughs> that was all I was doing previously. And then to be exposed to that experience of such a collaborative nature of such fun of like going out afterwards and having drinks and then having friends and having, you know, still conceptualizing after a couple of shots, like you're, you're creating magic with people. It's like being, you know, like in a music studio Mm. and it's like being in your closet, you know, recording music, which is a freaking way to start, go at it, Mm. do it, whatever way it takes for you. But, uh, to going to a studio and having lunch and kicking it and throwing around ideas and having magic and having somebody take your idea and run with it to the next one and embellish it. And, um, just, there's so much ooey gooey, yummy goodness that comes from a writer's room and so many brilliant brains that have so much more experience than you do or come from a different perspective and are cultural consultants of their own cultural and ethnic backgrounds too. So Hmm. you can make sure you're having a proper representation Hmm. of, you know, this person's voice, this person's experience. Um, so there's so much respect and honesty. There is the room you want filled with no men and no women and no people. Hmm. And you want people to shoot down ideas so that they can create better ones. Hmm. And there was nobody. I was working in a vacuum. So I was working in within my own, the echo chambers of my own mind. And I was so Aries independent with it, of course, that I never showed cuts to my family, really. I never showed my YouTube videos to my friends so much. Um, And I didn't get the, you know, the the collaborative nature that I did in that writer's room. Mm. I loved it. I got bit by the bug and now I, yeah, I can't stop. Hearing about the writer's room makes me think about how so many people try to pit traditional media and social Mm -hmm. media against one another. Yeah. The lines you, are blurred, honey. Yeah. They're gone. And you've lived in both worlds. Yeah. What's one thing that you think traditional media gets right that social media creators don't understand or maybe get wrong? Ooh. Damn, I'm woo-woo today. I'm about to mention the age of Aquarius. We are moving. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, girl. The stars are speaking to me. <laughs> um, we are moving into like an age, and I think it's just, I think you can tell on social media too, I think after um, a massive social awakening that was much needed in 2020 too, I think there was uh, the realization that we work better as a community, as a whole, as a together versus the age of the individual and that being, um, you know, there was such a focus on independence, on the rise of one, and there can only be one mm. on even women in the industry. There can only be one of this, one mm. of that. Um, and I think we're, you know, widening our table. I think we're the most invites ever are sent out. I think everybody's welcome. Mm. I think that's what we're trying to do. It's what the goal is. I think that's what traditional media can do really well. Social media, I think we still tend to pit women against other women Mm. in some sort of way. I think we're still trying to pit people against other people where why can't both exist at the same time? We don't know, we don't need, you know, this person versus this person. They both have so much to offer and are so brilliant in their own right. And both of their voices deserve to be amplified and heard. So why not let everybody speak? Everybody gets that mic. I think traditional uh, has notes of that sometimes, but I think there, I think from through my experience, at least I've had such a collaborative community and creative community um, versus the one that I had uh, online with myself Mm. or uh, the experiences I've, I've heard about or that I've seen online. So yeah, I think they get that. Yeah. What's one thing on the flip side, Liza, that you know, traditional media has evolved a lot. What's one thing that they could learn from social media creators like yourself as you step into the room? Trust, trust creators when it comes to the voices that they've honed and the abilities and the form of storytelling they've Mm. developed. Like when it comes to brands, trusting a creator, let them, let them speak through the lens. They have created trust with their audience with, you know, do you Don't, have an example of that? I almost said it. You saw me thinking about it. Didn't you? You saw my eyes yeah. turn left and think about the memory. Story? Cause I feel like a lot of your brand Absolutely. deals, like oh, yeah. you're like, it, it's in your voice. Oh yeah. Uh, I was even questioning right now because they wouldn't let me say the word vagina for a product <laughs> that I was, you know, uh, uh advertising essentially. Yeah. Um, and it was, a product for your vagina. And they wouldn't let me say that. And as a woman who talks openly about her experience with her period, why not? Like that just seemed so absurd to me that you create 
for this. And yet it's a, it's a tainted word to say. Mm. Um, yeah, that just blew my mind that, that, that wasn't allowed. Mm. And I think there should be more trust instead of a box to fill once yeah. again is yeah. what you're supposed to do or check these boxes off. No, let's make this a collaborative process. Let me tell you what's worked for me and why this is going to work for you. I really had to advocate once for a character I created to, uh, you know, work with a brand. And I knew this character was going to tell it through an enthusiastic, passionate lens versus mm. it just coming directly from me. And there's a lot of power in it coming directly yeah. from me. Like but I knew- Like characters like Jet or yeah, Helga. Like, yeah, yeah, it was a more- yeah, a recent character that was based on my mom was kind of like a Southern bill mm. raising hell. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, I, I loved that vehicle for, you know, this format. And I really had to show like, you'll see the proof is in the pudding. The yeah. proof is in my audience understanding that this is something that I do and something that is a form of entertainment, but also they'll actually understand the product better yeah. through this character than me. Mm. And so when you have that, you know, niche audience you've created that understands you, when you have that group of friends essentially that understands you, they're going to know the language that you all speak in the group chat. They're going to know the language you all speak, um, online mm. in that community. So yeah, trust, do trust you ever, the creators. Do you ever say no to a brand that you're yes. like, that, that gave you significant sums that you're like, oh, yeah. you know? Oh yeah. Oh, I was given, I was given, um, I can't cuss, right? You could do whatever you want. I was giving shit because <laughs> I left YouTube at one point. Yeah. And it was like, wow, you went for the big bucks, didn't you, girly? Mm, YouTube creators, they work. They 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 make make. Mm. And that wasn't something that was a priority for me. It was more so the quality for me. So I've said no to large sums, to small sums. It's not about the sums for me. It's about what's the final product look like when we collaborate together. Yeah. And that's not me trying to be higher than in any kind of way. It genuinely is. I want to put good shit out there. Totally. I don't want to I want to be proud of what we've created and I want to be able to talk about it afterwards with pride hmm. um so yeah I have said no it's fun saying no Liza how big was your team at the height of your YouTube career and how big is your team today because I think mm. you're talking a lot about community and not yeah. doing it alone how big is your team today yeah I mean it started with a big old group of friends back in the day uh creating videos together so I mean, it was less of, of a collaborative effort for my channel. Yeah. Um, it was something I would like would sneak off and go do in the depths of the night because <laughs> <laughs> I just loved creating characters and sketches and, and writing those scripts. Um, at the height of it though, you know, I had, I had the joys of working with Westbrook at one point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had a team there. Like you'll see always in the credits, if somebody else is editing, someone else has collaborated in some way, I give credit where credit yeah. is due. So that is in there. Yeah. Um, Westbrook being Will Smith's media company. Exactly. And that arm. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I think I'd have a total of I checked last night. I'm not going to say think. I have 142 <laughs> videos. So <laughs> about 20 or how many episodes of Lies on Demand was about 26 episodes total. Mm -hmm. um, massive collaborative effort, of course. Yeah. Hundreds of people behind that. Um, it was a massive family for three years, uh, three seasons. And then prior to that was a little Westbrook situation. So we would have, you know, um, uh, small productions. Mm -hmm. Like you and Will, like going jet skiing, like those kind yeah. of videos. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. on his channel though. Yeah, that was yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just featured. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> just a co-star. And then a lot of videos I, I, I wrote and, and yeah, scripted and edited and produced and posted by myself. Mm -hmm. And so those were moments like that, that I didn't really celebrate those like wins yeah. because I was just doing it solo. I, I didn't have a moment to be like, oh, yay. And to watch it with the community of, of the people who were actually watching, they were just numbers to me. And little do I realize they're real amazing humans, of course. Real quick, we'll get right back to the video, but I wanna say thank you to another one of our sponsors, Creative Juice. You know, the hardest part about being a creator today is honestly not the stuff you see on camera. It's the stuff that happens off of it. I'm talking about the finances, the operation, just the day-to-day -day of running a creator business. And that's where Creative Juice comes in. Simply put, Juice is a one-stop shop for all your business needs as a creator. They provide business funding, banking, and tax tools, and best of all, a community for creators. They just launched Juice Club, in fact, which is a great members-only community for creators where you'll get a lot of benefits like advanced bookkeeping tools, priority creator support, exclusive events and community, monthly AdSense advances, and so much more. And best of all, you get it all in one place for an affordable monthly price that's tax deductible. So check out the link below to get started. And now back to the video. I feel like you voice acted in your videos and your character yeah. for so many years now you're voice acting on the big screen yeah man. rc in the new transformers movie 
what were you doing to prepare for that, Liza? How were you training? Are you like in like your room, like practicing different intonations? Like just oh, yeah. take us through the sounds and some of the things you were doing to prepare for that role. Absolutely. It's pure chaos in a voice acting booth. I mean, <laughs> you're just losing all shit entirely. You're emoting, you're big. But for RC, I mean, that's the work that I've done. So lucky to have done with Disney. I'm mm. these like tiny characters with big voices or I'm a, I'm a reporter of some sort and the inflection is crazy. <laughs> and it's just fun to be able to experiment in those ways. But for RC specifically, I worked out for the role. I worked out do not be on camera i uh <laughs> i hope you can hear in the inflection in my voice how freaking ripped i am <laughs> that i'm shredded uh she's such a powerful character and she is the first female autobot to be featured in a live action transformers movie mm. so that first once again i'm so honored and the fact that she stands for so much that she is such a disciplined like dynamic character who has her backstory too uh she is She's kind of like, she gets all the boys together. She's like, come on, y'all, get your act together, which is really me and among my boyfriends. That sounded like I date heavy, I do. Um, <laughs> but me among my guy friends, I'm like, come on, y'all. It's always a woman to, to reel everybody in um, and lead the charge, which is what she does. And so I'm so honored to be able to play such a powerful figure like her. But she, uh, she's, she's toned. I mean, she's, she's a well-oiled machine is what she is. And they designed her beautifully. The animators knew what they were doing and we are looking and we are admiring respectfully, but she's beautiful. And so to step into like a lower register is, is really fun for me to like feel powerful and be down here and calling the shots. And can you give a few lines in her ooh, voice? Optimus. <laughs> she really does say Optimus like that. Um, I like, Wish. I'm putting you on the spot. You don't I know, know you to really do. are. I want to remember the voice actress. I'm forgetting her name. I'll have to do my research and honor her properly. But the voice actress really before me, that voice RC, she gave me some big old shoes to try and fill. She had a gorgeous voice for RC. And I had to loop it up and really just drink all the honey and tea and everything mm -hmm. to be down here and be commanding. Uh, but I don't have a line for you. No, that's a spoiler. I signed an idea. <laughs> you have to watch the movie. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Liza, your bio sticks out to me. Like you said, you're just a little brown girl with big dreams. Yeah. As we look ahead, what's your biggest dream? Oof. Let's say we're talking in five years, you're looking at your accomplishments, your milestones. What have you done? And how are people talking about Liza Koshi? Man, I mean, so many dreams have come true that I'm, I mean, no, you're being too humble. I, what, I, are the, what, are the, what are the, what are the projects? I'm I know you have big dreams. Like I do. I like, do. Like, are there I do, certain things like you want to be on the Oscar stage one day? Like you want to like, yeah. like, are there certain things like you've been part of, part of so many Hallmark parts of culture? I mean, like doing Nickelodeon's Double Dare, doing Rock and Eve. See, being like, humble gets you to hype like, me up. So I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> tell them more. Tell them more about what I've done. I mean, I could go through all your acting credits. So you've been on the late night shows. What, what's one thing that you're like, I need to check that off. Yeah. I want to do that. Like you, you're, you're so intentional. There's something that you're yeah. looking to add to your resume as you look at this new Absolutely. chapter, Liza 2.0. I mean, I think this is everybody and their mother in the creative industry and especially having the sketch background that I have and playing characters and loving that SNL all the way. Wow. I mean, I thought that was the path at one point watching that growing up. I thought, okay, I have to audition. And then I think Quinta Brunson said it best. You know, I, all I did was write a show and win Emmys and Golden Globes and well, now I'm here hosting SNL. <laughs> so if that's a path for me, that would be an honor to, you know, follow in, in her steps. But like, you know, the Issa Rays, the Quinta Brunsons, the creators of the world that have really broken down the ideas of what it means to be a creator in both traditional and digital um, would be honored. But I'm going to do it the Liza Koshy way. Mm -hmm. um, and SNL would be an absolute dream to write that monologue to, you know, Jimmy's feeling sick one day from the Oscars to fill his shoes in some way. Like I, I'll call it, I'll, I'll uh, manifest it in some way, but I really want to get more in behind, you know, productions and, and produce more, you know, use my DGA membership. Well, mm -hmm. keep it active. You have to keep <laughs> it active. So some directing, tell a story, do a musical. I'm heavily inspired by Lin-Manuel. Like, um, I, yeah, I think there's, it feels like so many dreams have come true at this point that, you know, why not keep 
keep dreaming. And someone told me recently, Natalie Johnson was her name. She's here uh, today. And she just dropped a gem on me and I'm going to repeat it for the rest of my life. She said, dreaming is a skill. Mm. And honing that skill and honing that craft is something that I've been doing and mm. will continue doing and will teach others to dream as big as they possibly can do. Mm. And any other final nuggets? You mentioned those. You mentioned a lot throughout yeah. this interview that you want to leave creators with. Well, this is such a name drop. You ready to catch it? I'm catching it. Uh, I heard this quote when I was hanging out with Michelle Obama. Got it? <laughs> Caught it. <laughs> um, Momo and I were hanging out and she, someone next to her actually said, when you feel like giving up, remind yourself of the reason you got started. And I heard that at such an inflection point in my own life where I was genuinely reminding myself of the joy that I had as the kid in my own living room, my own bathroom, my own car. And, um, I just, I'm recently taken back to like the other day where a kid said, Oh, Vine, oh, that's before my time. I was like, you uncultured swine, pop, get out of my, <laughs> like kids don't know Vine now, but that's where it all started for me 10 years ago. So yeah, I downloaded it just for fun, just as like a group message among my friends. And, you know, my studio was my car. My studio was my bathroom, not realizing it was a studio that would be in this one today. Um, but it just evolved. It took on a life of its own over the past decade. And I had the approval of my dad because I'm the youngest child and had that privilege. <laughs> so he kicked this little experiment to the curbs of L.A. and said, oh, what will happen if we let this one go rogue? And I went but not rogue initially, on the right? Not initially. <laughs> not initially. Right. You studied. Yeah, like he asked you to delete your followers, right? Did. And then you went off to your first year in college. Yes. Um, I want to ask about like what made him turn? Because you mentioned yeah. like his support. And yeah. I was listening to a podcast that you did where you very quickly mentioned a car ride home yeah. from the airport. Yes. Where your dad was taking you home from you your freshman your year. Yes. Yeah, I had to. I had to. And he's like, you know what, Liza? If this is what you want to do, yeah. you should become a creator full time. Oh my God. Word what, verbatim. What? That's exactly what he said. <laughs> we, we had a phone call before this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. What did you say? Exactly? Yeah, it was my pre call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, why do you think he had that turn of heart? What were you doing in that time? Yeah. Especially because I think there's so many creators who try to convince their parents Absolutely. to do this full time. And you Absolutely. did in one year. What, what happened there with your dad? What was that conversation, that car ride home yeah. about? And you say turn of heart, but I think it was always in my dad's heart. My hmm. mom and dad uh, met in theater. So huh. they're both theater kids at heart who made three obnoxious little <laughs> kids. And... I was really lucky to have the influence that was my middle sister mm. and was really lucky that she also tattled on me mm. and brought my phone to the table and said, there's a bunch of strangers following her on the internet. Oh, We're going to really? have to go through one by one and delete them. Dad and dad's like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is, this is creepy. You're my daughter's making videos on the internet for free and strangers are following her. No, one at a time blocked every single one. And it wasn't until a year later that I was on a uh, tour at a university, um, Emory university B, to be specific. This is where my sister went. Really? Yeah, no yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost did, but yeah. then I didn't <laughs> because our tour was being followed by another group of kids. Another tour was happening behind my own tour. And these were kids that were following me online mm. and said, you know, they came up to me and introduced themselves and said, I really appreciate the work that you're doing online. I love your videos. Can we take a picture together? And so we had this moment where we took this photo and my dad's just kind of observing from the side, trying to understand what's going on. And it was in that moment, ironically, at university where he said, you don't have to go to university. <laughs> <laughs> let's figure out what this is. I give mm. you my endorsement. You know, let's let's figure out this path for you since it's happening clearly. And I still remind myself of that, that making that child Liza at 19 with dreams proud. So it's always tapping back into that and honoring where you came from and doing so with my dad in mind, with my family in mind, with my faith in mind. Um, and just keep pushing, keep striving, keep with, your, with your sisters, with everyone. Thank you for yeah. getting started. I don't know if you have any other final words, but Liza, I am so excited to see you one day. I have no doubt that SNL monologue is going to happen. I'm going to try. We're going to manifest it. And uh, I'm so excited to see you evolve thank and you. go into this new chapter. Thank and you. And for all that you'll do. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. You too, John. <laughs> I love your story. I'm going to pick his brain once the cameras are off. But you are just so brilliant. So thank you so much for taking the time and the diligence. Y'all don't see this iPad, but it is full of notes. <laughs> And this man listens to podcasts on 3X speed. Sean Evans <laughs> listens to 2X speed, sure. Um, <laughs> you do the work. And so that that shines through. And I'm so appreciative of being seen as a human behind the scenes too. Yeah, you Thank did you. the best, Liza. Thank you so much. That's a wrap on Liza yeah! Koji. All right. <laughs>